are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. Man, we are here once again. And today, we have a, another special guest. We are going to talk about a book. It's called Not Okay, Okay. A roadmap, a roadmap back from the brink. And we have a special guest, Sheridan Taylor. He is from Canada. He served in the military. So I want to thank him for his service. We're going to learn a little bit about his book, but also a little bit about his life. So first and foremost, Sheridan, how are you doing, sir? Doing well this morning. Things are, things are unfolding great this morning. Awesome, man. Well, before we dive into your book, Not Okay, Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you decided to, you know, go into military and then after that, settle down and end up writing a book. Yeah, well, um, like so many uh, veterans and people that go into first responder type jobs, um, I was I was born into trauma uh, and generational stuff. Uh, it's, it's, and it's not just a thing that... Uh, it's 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 unfortunately uh, more the norm than people realize. Growing up in the seventies, uh, things like emotions were were forbidden. Right, we're we're taught little boys were taught uh, you can't be scared, you can't be lonely, you can't be sad. Right, these are these are weakness. Right, but the problem is we're human beings, so we get lonely, we get sad, we get scared. So we learn from our parents, or I learn from. From the adults around me, that if I have these reactions in my body, these external stimuli, then I am inherently bad. There's something wrong with me. That's the thing that I I just you know absorbed, right? Like osmosis, and it became uh, the central narrative of my life. It's the story I told myself all the time. Didn't always tell it to myself, but it was, and um. So I did the Batman thing. I was bullied and picked on, and I saw others being treated the same way. I was terrified of my parents. I was terrified of most of the adults in my life. So I decided I would be Batman. I'm going to grow up big and scary and, and make sure nobody ever gets hurt by bad people or scary people ever again. So I, uh, I got as scary as I could be. <laughs> and I joined the Army to get even scarier. And the Army didn't didn't uh i don't blame the army for any of my trauma i learned all that from trying to suppress you know the physiological responses in our body that we call emotions right um so uh, trying to not feel things that i couldn't help feel i tried i learned to to shut stuff off until eventually i um it took decades but i got to a point where i couldn't feel along the way um i enlisted uh, I deployed a couple times to Bosnia, a couple times to Afghanistan. I, I loved every second of my service. I regret none of it. Even the injuries, the the lifelong injuries. I have uh, I have degenerative spine damage, and my knees don't work all the time. But I do it all again. I would do it all again because I got to walk beside my heroes. I got to see incredible human beings do astounding things, and they called me an equal. That's that's, that has that's, that that is without price. There's there's no value you can place on having your heroes acknowledge you as an equal. And as uh, as a combat veteran, you also are a former uh, corrections officer as well. And with those type of leadership experiences, what were some of the values uh, like uh, principles that you took away from them, and that you use to apply to your everyday life? Um, well, I, uh, uh, that's a, that's an amazing question. Um, I've got, I've got goosebumps and chills. Um, I reached to the absolute bottom, um, about seven years ago when my first son was born, I was going to kill myself to save him from becoming just like me. And, uh, what actually saved me and has turned his life around and made life better for everyone in my family is leadership. I, uh, I had this moment where I was in the jail going into a maximum security area and I was holding the door as it was cycling. The, like the air, the pneumatic air system was like, 
as the guy in the control bubble kept cycling the door for me to go through. And I was just stood there frozen holding the door because my brain had made this connection between why, you know, the story I was telling myself that I was a terrible parent. And so I had to kill myself to save my children and, and my wife from me and leadership because leadership is is modeling the behavior that you want others to exhibit. You set the standard. You you be what you want others to be and they will follow you if you're doing if you're doing it right. And parenting, well, you can tell your kids anything you want, but they will do what you do and become what you are. So I made the decision um to to try to become the man that I want my sons to become. I had this mantra, like, what would my son's, my first son's name is, uh, is Trace, T-R-A-C-E, Trace Taylor. And so I would have this mantra in my head, what would grown up Trace do now? And I began to work really hard on catching my thought patterns and instinctive responses to scenarios and situations because they weren't healthy and they weren't things I want my kid to do. And I would try to take a step back, pause for a moment, and ask myself, what would I want Trace to do if he were here now? And then i try to do that. I didn't know how to be a dad, so I just faked it, man. I just faked it and uh, started doing what I wanted my son to do when he became me. <laughs> and with that, uh, what was some of the things that you try to do with your son to build that morale up and also to use it as a, a reflection a reflection tool to understand that you know you're not alone but you have someone you can lean on uh we started he and i started working together on um first of all i had to he had to learn to not be scared of me because i had i had taught him what i had learned and I became the scary, angry man that, that, that had frightened me all my childhood. So I had to start modeling behavior. And I had, so what I had to do is I started having to tell myself, uh, uh, first of all, let's, let's back up a step. First of all, I had to learn to forgive myself for wrongs I had not committed. And I had to learn to accept that I am worthy of of love of not only being loved by others but i'm worthy of loving me and that i am a child of the universe of divinity like every other human and that i am responsible for caring for every child and that includes me because i'm someone's child once i began to be able to accept those fundamental truths i was able to start working with my son trace and helping him learn to just sit in emotions whether they were good you know quote unquote good or bad whether they were um uh whether, whether it was anger or joy or sadness or fear or or loneliness or calm or or happiness whatever the emotion was he was going through I had to learn to sit in it with him so he could learn to sit in it. Otherwise, it wouldn't process and it would just ball up. And I learned to, uh, fuck man. I learned how to play for the first time in my life since I don't know when. I, I've learned how to just be silly and follow my son's lead and when, when they're playing whatever game they're playing. Right, like if if my if my kids are pretending they're um, a pack of hyenas because they just finished watching a cartoon with a hyena in it, and they and I'm a gazelle. Well, guess who's laying on the floor while his kids are, you know, quote unquote, attacking him with tickles, right? And I had to learn how to how to lead my son through just sitting in an emotion. And with that said, this on Refocus Radio, talk to our guest today, Sheridan Taylor. You can go visit his website, SheridanTaylor.ca. And let's 
introduce the book because I think that ties into everything you're just talking about. Uh, the book is not okay. Okay. A roadmap back from the brink. It chronicles your, what you just been talking about, talking about your, your personal story, your, your experience dealing with some of the darkest points in life. Tell us a little bit of your goal from writing this book. My goal was just, well, it from the start out as a book, man, like, um, around the same time Trace was born and I began getting serious about trying to, um, better myself because I, I, I had to, I had to fight all the, the darkness in my, in my soul, in my brain, all the lies I was telling myself. So I was doing some really intensive therapy, group therapy and individual therapy, and I was exploring various forms of spirituality and, um, while I was doing all that, I realized that I had spread the same toxic, um, harmful lessons to uh, to younger, newer troops in the army and younger officers in corrections. These ideas of, uh, you know, the the rugged individual, tough guy doesn't feel emotions; they're not issued to you, right? The 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 classic, you know, nineteen fifties cowboy or war hero right the the lone lone gunman or war you know uh, i i taught my you know I, I call them my kids i taught these young these young troops and officers these same harmful lessons about suppressing emotions and denying them and repressing them and i decided to reverse that as best i could i was putting posts up on social media uh detailing my struggles with mental illness, with depression, with anxiety, with PTSD, with uh, with the grief over my first wife's death, and uh, my inability to to move through all that, uh, and and my 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 therapy, is in hopes of trying to remove stigma from others. So if if I'm voicing this, then maybe someone else somewhere who needs to hear the same message will find find whatever it is they need in them to step forward and say, yeah, me too. I want some help and get it. And, uh, I was, um, writing emails and, uh, and letters to people on a one-on-one basis, helping them by explaining what I was going through, what I knew about psychology, what I knew about, about treatment and, and what, what was working for me, what wasn't working for me. And, and you know, trying try to break down, you know, the, the terminology in, in layman's terms, with a lot of swearing. A lot of swearing because that's how I normally talk. I'm being real good here, and um, and I was writing these letters and emails for my sons to read when they were old enough, so that advice on how to avoid all the traps and pitfalls that sucked me in and and brought me to the that that, that, that killed my first wife and that that almost killed me. And and um, I realized. But all of these these three separate streams all flowed together into one river, and it it's what got me through, got me to a point where I could find calm and joy in life, and and become the man that I didn't know I could be. And so I wrote the book where I just kind of smashed all this stuff together, honestly, um, and made it kind of fit, and in hopes that. Anybody out there who reads it will know that it doesn't—it doesn't matter how alone you think you are in your own uh, your despair or your grief or your shame or your remorse or, or or whatever whatever story you're telling yourself about or how awful you are and your life is that you're not alone that you're not alone. I was there. I got through it. I fall sometimes. I get back up and I keep moving. Because others showed me that same path. I'm not alone, which means you're not alone. I just want everyone in the world to know, like, we're seven or nine billion people, and we all feel like we're alone, but we're not. Someone loves you. Someone loves you, man. This is our Refocus Radio talking to our guest, Sheridan Taylor. Go to his website, SheridanTaylor.ca. He also get his book, Not Okay, Okay, a roadmap back from the brink. And you touched on your military experience. Let's talk about the transition to becoming a civilian again. 
And I know part of that was writing a book, but it's touched on what was healing like for you. How did you approach that process? What were some of the tools that you used to keep yourself above the water so that way you're always having that ability to seek the positive? Oh, man, that was... uh, uh, I refused to transition to civilian life because when I uh, enlisted, that was the only time I found self-worth and identity. So when I was medically released from my injuries, um, I tried, I just found a job where I could, you know, maintain the same sort of lifestyle, same sort of mentality, same sort of emotional unwell, unwellness. Um, I've, I've only really truly begun to transition in the last few years um, because I, Two years ago, I, I walked off the jail. So I walked out and I, I won't go back. I won't be a weapon anymore. And uh, I started writing this book, I don't know, like 2019. Well, writing the, the posts and the, the emails and stuff, you know, 2019. So the transition was probably from about 2019 to 2021. I was still in corrections, but I was, I was changing the way I saw myself and therefore the world. Um, I began to transition to civilian life by recognizing that my war wasn't with anything outside, that I was fighting me and I was losing badly. And so I, uh, I decided to stop fighting the natural responses in my body and start fighting the, the, um, the outright lies. I was telling myself in my head about how, what kind of man I was and what kind of human I was and wasn't and couldn't be. And I started trying very hard to just become a man who didn't, I know, I know, I stopped trying to define myself by what kind of harm I could cause others. And I started trying to define myself by deciding, trying to figure out what kind of good I could do in the world without any form of violence. Trying to, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you you mentioned earlier about uh, we're not alone. And I think that's a key message because that's something that I can't speak for no one, but I think a lot of people can feel that way certain points of their life, especially they hit failure or they don't hit their goals that they want to hit or someone else wanted them to hit and they didn't do it. So now they have this chip on their shoulder and they're like, it's always in the back of their brain. So they can never approach the new day because they approach the new day with the past instead of the future. For you as a veteran, how did you approach the day and not um, get caught up into the past and allow, and allowing that to hold you back from living your life. That's 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 the that's the key, man. That was that was the biggest struggle because um, so many times I spent I spent I mean I wasted so much of my life worrying about the wrong two days, man. I kept I kept worrying about yesterday. Right, all the stuff I did wrong yesterday, all the things people did or said, or or all the hurt, and and I just held on to that pain like a dog with a bone, just chewing it and chewing it and chewing it and hanging on to it, ruminating on it over and over again, letting that letting that carve this this channel in my brain, this 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 channel of worthlessness. And so I worry about that day. I worry about yesterday all the time. And I worry about tomorrow because if yesterday was awful, today is awful. That means tomorrow is going to be awful. Everything's going to, there's just a, there's a never ending. That's what anxiety is, right? Like depression is hanging on to yesterday and anxiety is worrying about tomorrow. And I had to learn to pull myself out of those two days because if all I'm doing is worrying about yesterday, when it's gone, I can't focus on today. And if, I'm not focusing on trying to make today good, then tomorrow is going to suck because I made today suck by worrying about yesterday and the day before that yesterday. So I had to start learning to just, hey, what happened yesterday happened yesterday. It's gone. What did you learn yesterday that you can apply today to make tomorrow 
a little better? If not for you, for somebody else, what can you do to make tomorrow better for your wife? What did you screw up yesterday <laughs> that made her life worse that you could repair today and, and change that thought process today so that tomorrow is better for her? And then what can you do for your kid? And then by making, because it's all about connections, brother, man, everything, everything is about relationship. So when I, when I focus on trying to make the day or the moment just a little bit brighter for my wife or for one of my little boys or for both of them, for everybody, then my day just naturally becomes a little bit better. When I see, when I see my baby smile, my day becomes better. And I get that feeling of, of self-esteem and self-worth from knowing that I did a thing for somebody I love and it made them happy and it made their life a little bit better for that moment. And that that is the most that is the strongest lesson that I had to learn because uh, uh, my first wife and I were together for twenty years. We were deeply damaged children who learned sort of how to heal together, but not not completely. We didn't we didn't do enough. And her depression, her depression killed her. Talked about feeling alone. Well, we were two people who loved each other desperately, but couldn't tell each other that or show each other that. So we both felt horribly, horribly alone. And she starved to death, man. She starved to death because she was completely alone, living beside the man who loved her more than anything in the world. So I learned, I learned that not a day goes by where I'm going to worry about what I can do to make things better for the people I love today, because that means tomorrow is going to get better for everybody. And with that said, uh, there's times on the show where I will share this with people because it's a saying, I don't know when I started, but. I think it was around college time. And I I would say uh, it's two things. One that came from myself and another from uh, Blaise Pascal, uh, a quote from him. So there's one I'll share, and that is um, in life, our pain can be someone else's medicine. Because when you go through life and you experience certain pain, sometimes only you to say certain things to someone who's going through what you already survived. And the other thing is, uh, Blaise Pascal had a quote that I put in my wallet until I graduated from college. And that was, in uh, life, there's enough, I mean, excuse me, in faith, there's enough light for those who want to believe, but there's also enough shadows to blind those who don't. And that's been my... Uh, compass, if you will, to get back on track because not, life is going to knock you down. It's not going to ask you if you're going to be knocked down. It's just going to blindside you and it's just going to hit you. But we have to either choose to get up or stay down. Right. And that quote, I believe, is is facts. There's enough light for you to see, but there's also shadows that will blind you if you focus only on the shadows. And to your point, in order to embrace the future, you have to create the memories now. Mm -hmm. Because if you wait to create the memories, time's gonna run out and you won't have anything to create. So has someone on the show, I'm throwing back to you, but has someone on the show who said the power of making the time to create a memory, whatever it is, spending time with family, going on an adventure, you know, work on a hobby. They were saying, if you take that moment now to do it, then you don't have to regret it later because you didn't ever did it, you know? Because we always say we don't have time. But time is not waiting for nobody. We all have a watch, but it doesn't wait for you to read it. 
<laughs> you just have to do it. You have to do it. You, you got to have that fun. You got to do that, you know, hobby. You got to do that time with family. You got to do whatever it is you're trying to do, your dream, whatever. You can't wait for somebody to give you permission. You can't wait for someone to give you permission to write a book. So for you, you didn't wait for permission to write a book or, you know, share your story with others. How do you keep yourself uh, motivated so that you can continue to share your story and inspire people? I don't even worry about motivation, brother. It just comes to me, man. I get, uh, I worry about discipline, make myself do things I don't want to do. Like, cause I'm, I'm deeply introverted. So trying to reach out to people to tell my story is hard, but, but I can't stop because man, I got, I got like 200 messages in various forms of, you know, like emails or, or phone calls or, or whatever, right? Like messages on the internet or, or like just, 200 people have told me, or well, well, over that now, have told me that, you know, the story reached them and it made them find something inside. They touched the thing they needed to touch inside them to do the things they needed to do to get the help they needed to get to make their life better. Man, like people, people have told me that my story helped them save their life. Or help them save their family. Man, I can't stop because how many more, right? Like every single one individual who reaches out to me and says that, you know, me me finding the, the, the courage to, to share, me finding the strength to be vulnerable, made their life better. Well, that means that it made the life of everyone they touch better. I can't stop, man. That's good what you just said. That's good what you just said, because I remember someone else said uh, to me before, you know, if you're trying to spread light, just light a match, because you're going to help someone catch on fire as well. So you're spreading that light by making that first move, that first spark, because if you hold it, then you might regret it. You might look back and be like, man, what if I would have said this? Or what if I would have done that? Or what if I would start my business? Or what if I wrote my book? Or what if, whatever, whatever. You just fill in the blank. And there's an Air Force guy uh, who's on my show. He said, uh, the only thing that matters is the dash. It ain't the day you're born. It ain't the day you take your last breath. It's the dash. <laughs> and I was like, man, that is so good. And he explained it too. I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't say word for word, but he was basically like, every day you decide how you're going to live your life. You either live it big, you live it small, or you live it whatever, but you define it. No one, no one defines it for you. No one, def- no one has a definition for, for uh, Sheridan. Right, man. You I'll define you. it. Sorry. I tell you, man, like, there are, there are two things in the world that are heavier than anything else, and they will suck you down and weigh you down and, and, and just destroy you. And that's, that's shame and regret, man, because guilt isn't a bad thing, man. Like guilt, guilt is just your body telling you, like, hey, you shouldn't have done that, so don't do it again. And you go, okay, right? You learn your lesson. You say you're sorry to whoever you need to say you're sorry to and make the world a better place doing that. But, but regret, man, you can't, you, can't, you can't get that back. You, you you lost something. You lost a moment in time. You lost an opportunity. You regret, and it just eats at you, and it, it it never stops. And shame shame isn't even ours to pick up. Like someone puts that on us like a rucksack, but it's so hard to put down the weight that you should never have had to carry in the first place. So carrying those things, man, it's there is nothing worth carrying regret or shame, and you're trying to find a way to live your life in the now, doing what, doing what you got to do. Not necessarily what you want to do, because you know what I want to do is go have a bowl of ice cream, right? What I've got to do right now is do this podcast and take the dog for a run, <laughs> right. right? But it's not out there. I don't want to do that. You don't want to do that, but we gotta, we got a window of time. It's got to get done, so we're gonna do it. Because if I don't. I'm going to feel regret because my dog is slowing down. She's getting old. Her hips are seizing up a little bit. She's just too long. So I got to take her out and move. So, so it's little things, but the little things become big things. And 
finding finding the strength to just do what needs doing so you don't ever have to live with regret or shame. That changes the world. It changes your world, which changes the world, I guess. Once again, listen on Refocus Radio. And man, this was a amazing interview with Sheridan Taylor. Go to his website, SheridanTaylor.ca and make sure you go get his book. It is not okay, okay? A road map back from the brink. Once again, Sheridan, I want to say thank you for your service. Thank you for what you are doing to uh, inspire people and hope it will inspire people to continue to push forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the voice. I appreciate it so much.